rabbis in Medina posed questions to Muhammad, peace be upon him, that only a true prophet could answer in a bid to admonish him. One was, tell us of the young man who traveled to earth's west and east. Yet the Quran's response was astonishing. After Nimrod's reign, a pious king arose whose father was from Yemeni Tababia royalty and mother from Greece. He once presided in the case of Bir Saab or Bir Sheba Wells, where he judged in favor of Prophet Abraham. Upon him be peace. He was so impressed by Abraham's pure monotheism that he embraced it and walked to do Hajj alongside his horse. For showing humility, Abraham revealed that Allah would enable Dhul Qurnayn to master the winds and their course. Allah gave Dhul Qurnayn, or the two-horned one, the means to conquer the world, including armies, wealth and skill. His empire spanned the horns of the sun east to west, and he sported horns or braids on his head to fit the bill. At the offset, it's clear from the Quran that Dhul Qurnayn was a humble, pious monotheist in a time before Jews. Many have wrongly assumed him to be Alexander the Great, Cyrus or Darius, but they all fail if history is pursued. For example, Alexander called himself the son of Zeus, set up idols and had illicit relations unworthy of accolade, and the others were fire-worshipping Zoroastrians, and even if they shared similarities, none can match his grade. Only four kings have ruled the entire earth. Two evil, Nimrod and Nebuchadnezzar, at a time when records were scant. Two were good, Prophet Solomon and Dhul Qurnayn, peace be upon them, and in the near future such a rule to Jesus will Allah grant. Dhul Qurnayn's military advisor was Al-Hidr or Melchizedek, a righteous prophet whom Allah gave a life extended. After Abraham rescued Lot, peace be upon them both, from his captors, he gave a portion of war spoils to Hidr, who blessed him as intended. Hidr had drunk the water of life and turned dried vegetation into lush greenery, from which is derived his name. He is also the one who taught Moses, peace be upon him, is listed as a Sahaba and maybe the youth who exposes the Jal's end game. Firstly, Dhul Qurnayn headed west towards Al Ayun and the Al Khalidah or Canary Islands by the Atlantic Ocean. From Dhul Qurnayn's perspective, it seemed as if the sun set in Hamia or murky boiling water in fetid commotion. Some joke that Muslims believe the sun actually sets in water, but the Quran states the sun has an orbit in space. In fact, the Canaries were volcanically active 4,000 years ago, forming Lanzarote's caves by steam in the lava face. There he came across a people where Allah tested his leadership, giving him the decision to punish or kindly treat. Wisely, he gently guided the good, but punished the wrongdoers, who'd also be punished in hell, in subjugated defeat. His second campaign was due east, to where the sun rises, not sunrise, and the people had no shelter from its rays. Allah knows best if it was in the treeless and flat arctic circle, where the sun stays risen during six-month days. Indigenous sub-arctic tribes used to seek shelter in igloos and trenches and caught fish, as scholars elucidated, but Allah knows best if it was the ancestors of the Inuits or Eskimos whom Dhul Qurnayn empowered and placated. Fascinatingly, along the Silk Road during Abraham's time, peace be upon him, now extinct civilizations talked about a two-horned king, such as the Harappans of Mohenjo-Daro in Pakistan and the Taklamakans of Lake Isikul, meaning hot spring. Surah Kaf mentions his final trip took him through a mountain pass where he met a tribe unable to communicate. By using translators he found out they were being decimated by the evil Gog and Magog and needed to separate. On this campaign he went north and only Allah knows if he crossed the Arctic into the Americas or headed west. Yet there are remnants of vanished tribes who sacrificed babies such as the Olmecs and Kurgans but Allah knows best. Gog and Magog, or Ya'juj wa Majuj, were ruthless tribes who swooped through valleys, killed, pillaged and withdrew. They needed to be cordoned off from humanity behind a barricade that they could neither scale nor dig through. Gog and Magog were human descendants of Noah's son Japheth, peace be upon them both, from whom arose the Turkic Slavonic Mongol races. The Prophet, peace be upon him, described them as being well built, having red hair, small eyes and wide, flat, shield-like faces. They asked him to build a barrier, to dam the hordes for payment, but he said Allah had already enriched him well. He only required their manpower, and being the first ever person to shake hands, his diplomacy made the team gel. 
he asked blacksmiths to cast iron blocks, a kintar of 50 kilograms each, then stack them with wood and bellow them red. Then molten copper was poured over the wall until it resembled a black and red striped thobe, a Sahaba later said. Barriers built to lock out Mongols and Tatars have been confused with Dulkurnains, such as China's Great Wall. Others include the Alexander and Caspian Gates, Pass of Daryl and Durban, but none match the actual one at all. Just like Dulkurnain's real name, the Jews say it's Abimelech, or my father is king, the wall remains secreted, and even if discovered, it will remain as Allah wills, and claiming to know better than Allah will leave us defeated. In error, some say the wall is in ruins and Gog and Magog are Khazar Jews. But against the Sunnah is such a view. Allah said the wall is a mercy and will remain intact until the undefeatable Gog and Magog swarms break through. A clear proof is that Allah will tell Jesus to climb Mount Sinai to avoid people against whom none will be able to fight. And Hadith reveal at that time Jesus would have destroyed the Dajjal and his followers and the Sunnah guides aright. During the Prophet's peace be upon him's time, a digit-sized hole appeared in the wall behind which the evil tribes daily chip it away. When the idiots see sunlight, they back off to return every next day to find it re-fortified until one fateful day. It is really a mercy that Yajuj wa Majuj don't carry on digging when they see sun rays or work during the night. But when Allah intends, one will say, we'll break through tomorrow, inshallah, and wreak havoc and global blight. For at that time, when Jesus has descended and destroyed the Dajjal and united the whole world together in Islam, Allah will cause the most beneficial man-made structure to crumble to dust and allow Gog and Magog to cause harm. They will surge like crashing waves swarming stealthily from every mound, pouncing upon any believers they see, free from their barrier, vengeful and vile. There are so many of them that they will drink dry the Sea of Galilee. Cynically, Gog and Magog are touted as the protectors of London and paraded in the mayor's show as traditional fun. Yet when the barbarians are really let loose and begin their indiscriminate killing spree, in horror they'll be undone. After killing many land-dwelling people, they will hurl spears skywards that will return with blood and then exclaim, We've even killed the inhabitants of the sky. Allah knows best if they are jinn UFOs or man-made aeroplanes. Only the fortified will survive, and 12,000 or so with Jesus, peace be upon him, will climb Mount Sinai or Tur near Tabuk and hold out. Jesus will then beseech Allah, and he will send neck-burrowing worms to destroy Gog and Magog as if in one shout. A brave believer will scout them and be delighted to find them all dead. Allah will then cleanse the earth with rain. He will send huge birds with necks like camels to remove their corpses, and thus will begin Jesus' glorious reign. The believers will use the bows and arrows of Gog and Magog for seven years as a means of fuel, heat and light. Allah's reign will cause miraculous yields of livestock and fruits and such a peaceful world will be a beautiful sight. Jesus will live either for seven years until he's 40 or 40 years until he's 73 after he returns aged 33 from the skies. During his reign, he'll marry, perform Hajj in Mecca and be buried next to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he dies. On the last day, 999 out of every 1,000 humans, mostly from Gog and Magog, will be set aside to enter hellfire, indicating that they are disbelievers and have been growing in number, unbeknown to us, and their ending is dire. Dulkurnain's summary in the Quran shows the qualities of a great leader, strong in faith, diplomacy and might. His goal was not fame, power or money, but to guide the ignorant into a way of life pleasing to Allah and do